panel called Simply Free Palestine. Uh, we've got three speakers with us this afternoon, or indeed is it this morning. Um, we have uh, Anthony Lowenstein, who's flown down especially from Sydney to participate in this panel. He's an independent journalist, uh, an author, and a co-author of various books to do with the question, uh, notably uh, My Israel Question, which was released a number of years ago. And also, more recently, he's the co-author of a book called After Zionism, um, so dealing with the questions of uh, the solution to the situation in Palestine. Uh, our second speaker is um, Tufi Haddad, who is a Palestinian-American Marxist. He also is an author and a writer on these issues. Uh, he wrote the preface to a book called Between the Lines. Um, we're getting dramatically copies of these books passed up to us right now. <laughs> Indications. This is Anthony's book and this is Tufik's book. Um, and the other book, um, yeah, we've got, we've got a bunch of books upstairs, as hopefully people have noticed. Um, our third speaker tonight is Kim Bullimore. Uh, she works with the International Women's Peace Service in Palestine. Uh, she's a long-time anti-racist campaigner, and she's also the author of a chapter in a book, actually edited by Anthony, um, called Keep Left, 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 left Turn, left, left Turn, left turn um, and uh, on, on the situation in Palestine and the BDS movement. So um, please welcome everyone, uh, all three speakers here today. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for having this panel, having this conference in general. Uh, I've got a lot to cover uh, today, so I'm uh, going to speak kind of fast uh, because, uh, well, I mean, basically what I'd like to try and get out of this talk is, uh, or you guys to try and get out of this talk, is um, the fact that sort of the discourse around Palestine has sort of become rather formulaic these days. It's uh, repetitive, and uh, the media sort of repeats it, the politicians repeat it, and we have to be able to sort of very quickly uh, latch on to it, be able to break it down as activists and be able to counter it. And so my talk is sort of designed to be able to do that. Uh, I'm going to start with talking about uh, Obama's recent trip to uh, Palestine, Israel, the whole the region, actually. Uh, in which he sort of repeated all these known uh, 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 sort of formulaic tropes. Uh, he started off by describing Israel as a, a vibrant democracy, not, not uh, mentioning that it was an ethnically uh, racist, uh, exclusivist state practicing apartheid. He uh, sort of uh, harkened back to the Zionist narrative that uh, the, the Jews returned to their, their, their lands uh, from which they were expelled in biblical times as though the Bible was some kind of uh, real estate document. Uh, he, he discussed the fact that Israel made the desert bloom as though it took a, uh, you know, a, a, an act of genius to, to steal another people's crops and land and water and then water the plants and then make them, them bloom. Uh, on security, he said the following. He said, I'm proud that the security relationship between the United States and Israel has never been stronger. More exercises between our militaries, more exchanges among our political, military, and intelligence officials than ever before. The largest program to date to help you retain your qualitative military edge. This is when he spoke to an audience of Israeli youth at a university. Uh, he also he began to begin express certain forms of caution. Uh, which I think are rather indicative of the situation that we're in, and, and uh, pay attention to it. He says, firstly, you can be the generation that permanently secures the Zionist dream, as though he, as the American president, has a concern that the Zionist dream is ultimately fulfilled. However, you are facing growing challenges to your future. Demographics west of the Jordan River are not in your favor. And the only way for Israel to endure and thrive as a Jewish and democratic state is through the realization of an independent and viable Palestine. These sort of slogans you will be hearing more and more, and I'm going to try and explain where they come from. Of course, when it came to more specifics, Obama was a lot more uh, vague or, or used a different set of, of codes, shall we say. He said security must be the center of any agreement. Security is, of course, Israel gets determined what security is and what it means. And in fact, everything Israel has done through the past 60 years has been justified on the basis of security, of course. Uh, direct negotiations between the two parties 
of course, embodying great asymmetries in power uh, is the only way to achieve an agreement. Of course, also uh, putting down the option that you would go through any international forum, such as the United Nations uh, or, or whatnot. Uh, and then he also notably uh, uh, abandoned what used to be a kind of condition for the return to negotiations, which was that Israel would need to stop its settlement expansion. Uh, he said, if the expectation is that we can only have direct negotiations when everything is settled ahead of time, then there's no point for negotiations. I think it's important to work through this process even if there are irritants on both sides. Uh, so he described settlement policy as an irritant to both sides, something that we sort of just have to uh, be adults about and uh, sort of uh, deal with somehow. He said this great scion of hope, the man who ran on the campaign of change we can believe in, this hopeful figure, he said, peace is possible. I'm not saying it's guaranteed. I can't even say it's more likely than not. But it's possible. <laughs> Thank you, Obama. <laughs> okay. So, what do we make of these positions? Okay. Uh, as I said, they're sort of formalized and standardized. You'll be hearing this rhetoric again and again. Uh, in fact, we've had 20 years of this crap <laughs> in the peace process. <laughs> okay, so. uh, well, what do we make of it? First, I think it's important to identify that this is a rightward shift in American policy, okay? It's, if it's change you can believe in, Obama's slogan, it's a rightward change. <clears throat> excuse me. I mean, particularly the focus upon, <clears throat> excuse me, yeah, Ex on, on um, uh, particularly the focus on west of the, I don't have time to drink. <laughs> <laughs> Take a drink. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you an extra five seconds. <laughs> Okay, particularly his focus on the demographics west of the Jordan River as though Israel is, uh, you know, one area that has legitimate right to count who's on which side, how many people are on this, you know, the occupied territories are a legitimate part of the democratic, demographic consideration of the area as though this is legitimate. His insistence, he also insisted on Palestinians recognizing the Jewish character of the state. It's a very crucial point. It's a George Bush refused to do such a thing. It's the equivalent of essentially calling upon a people or a country to recognize a particular religious or ethnic uh, political ascription to, the, to a state. So it's not just uh, recognize Australia, the state of Australia and the citizens of Australia. It's the recognition of Australia as white country or a Christian country, in this case, a Jewish country. Uh, so, uh, and then, of course, uh, Obama himself even went and visited uh, Theodore Herzl's grave. I mean, Theodore Herzl is like one of the, you know, I mean, he's the man who formalized the idea of the Jewish state. He uh, uh, idolized uh, 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 known imperialist races such as Cecil Rhodes, ca calling him, uh, you, you know, uh, uh, somebody who he consciously identified the, the, the Zionist project as trying to embody, similar to how Rhodes built uh, the racist state of Zimbabwe or, or Rhodesia back in the day. In any case, uh, so how do we understand uh, these talks, other, th th this sort of American approach, other than it just being a rightward shift? Well, it's part of the larger game. Uh, uh, it's how the United States has been addressing the question of its empire in the Middle East region and how Palestinian nationalism is perceived as a strategic threat to both wings of its imperial policy in the region. Okay, So the United States runs the region through alliance with moderate Arab states on the one side, the, the, the moderate dictators on the one side, and support of Israel on the other. Palestinian nas nationalism sandwiched in between the two because of their connections through their Arab, religious, cultural, historical, linguistic ties to the Arab people. Con th their national cause continually re-raises the fact of these areas' suppression under US-sponsored dictatorships. On the other hand, Palestinian resistance to Zionist colonialism throughout the ages has never stopped and therefore they threaten that side of the equ equation. Therefore, therefore, the question is for America, how do you manage, how do you subvert, how do you possibly, if need to, liquidate the Palestinian national question? 
So that's the fundamental. So when he speaks about peace process, everything America has done for the last 20, 60 years has been within that vein. How to manage or perhaps uh, liquidate, if need be, via Israel, of course, and other tools, the question of Palestinian nationalism itself. Okay? So, uh, the last 20 years has largely been marked by the main strategy being the peace process era. Okay? The peace process era was also formulated, though, to understand its current structure. One must understand the basic structure of the nature of the Israeli occupation post-1967. Essentially because in the 67 war, the, the main enemy Israel was confronting at the time, on behalf of US imperialism, was the question of Arab nationalism, pan-Arab nationalism. The Palestinian question was not even so much on the agenda, to be truthful. Uh, it was considered a war to defang Nasser, who was raising the questions of pan-Arab nationalism and the, the overall colonial context of the Arab regimes versus the uh, versus vis-a-vis -vis the West. But because that war was so short and only lasted six days, Israel came to occupy a population that was more than a million strong of Arabs in underneath now Israel's purview, okay, occupation of course. What did this mean? This meant Israel as a state which considered itself a Jewish democratic state and a very important to have both of those elements as part of its self-identification, which gave it the legitimacy and the ability to begin to attract as a viable project, both to other Jews as well as the imperial powers to be able to sell it beyond, uh, sell it beyond. The fact being that now, having come to control more than a million non-Jews in the, quote, Jewish democratic state meant that if they give citizenship to these people, it would erode the Jewish character of the state, and if they did not, it would erode the democratic character of the state. So, the fundamental contradiction here, and there was no getting around this question. Either you kick the Palestinians out, that remains on the agenda, but you can't necessarily do that now. Why? Because you have strong Arab countries and oil interests and whatnot, and it might totally destabilize the entire Arab world if you try and do that. The solution was manage try and formulate some kind of other agreement. So this, great, okay. So basically, they came up with this plan called the Elon Plan. The Elon Plan formulated the parameters of how Israel was to strategically determine these new areas and these new populations. It said, basically, take from them what you want, leave what you don't want. What we want was the land, was the water, was the hilltops, was certain ideological important areas for Zionism and, it, 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 and its belief system. What it didn't want was the Palestinians. And for the Palestinians, they sought to find some form of intermediary leadership that would be able to take control of the Palestinians in terms of civil and security matters, to get them off the books so that they wouldn't be considered part of the contradiction of the Jewish democratic state. This being a temporary measure in the context of a larger plan where Hopefully one day we could get rid of this problem more fundamentally, but in the current balance of forces, we can't do that right now. So that's, those are the basic things that we have to keep in our mind. Now, they thought, sought different forms of collaborationist intermediaries to play this role. They thought the Jordanians and the Egyptians could play it. At a certain point, because of historical conditions that I can't go into, the PLO came to play this role when they signed the 1993 Oslo Accords. This was based upon the assumption that America and Israel had found their partner to peace, okay? Their intermediary role who would accept to a non-fully sovereign uh, 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 sort of administrative role to the Palestinian question uh, within these, these specific needs of the era. Of course, uh, as we know, this process started in 1993 and in 2000 it failed because Arafat was unwilling to sign onto this agreement, okay? Because in the end, when they tried to finally give him the final conditions of it, it was not, nothing less than a condition of full surrender. Not one recognition of any of the historical Palestinian national rights, right of return, right of statehood, right to Jerusalem, and to settlement expansion, etc. Palestinians, after that point, this leadership became redundant, unnecessary, needed to be structurally re, re, re bludgeoned so that it would fulfill the role that it needed to be. So the second stage of the 
peace process came about, which was the Intifadas, which was actually a one-sided war initially launched by Israel to literally bludgeon the Palestinians into a new form of political entity, both to mass terrorize the people, to, to, to erect a map on the ground that would structurally make it impossible for them to completely divide them. They erected more than 500 checkpoints. They erected 800 kilometers of wall, all these checkpoints and, and, and watchtowers. They killed the most important organic field leaders, military and political. They arrested and injured tens of thousands of them uh, essentially conducted a pa mass pacification policy against it. Palestinians were considered a form of cancer, and they were needed to burn into con their consciousness their own defeat. That was literally the words of the Israeli chief of staff at the time. Today, this chief of staff is the minister of defense who called Palestinians cancer, and that one day we may need to amputate them. Uh, the third stage is once they were sufficiently bludgeoned, or believed to be sufficiently bludgeoned, it came the state building phase, which is the phase that we are in today, which is a much more sophisticated approach. I'm going to talk tomorrow on neoliberalism and the Palestinian new elite, which is about this last phase, about the techniques, the economic and political techniques using neoliberal conceptualizations of the state to use sort of economic bombs to socially re-engineer a Palestinian class that is more complicit uh, to the needs of the era. The point is, to bring it, wrapping it up, I've got five minutes, I've been told. Uh, one, we are in a stage of strategic dangers in the era. I think the current era has both strategic dangers as well as strategic hopes, okay? First, with the dangers, the fears, okay, which are not small. Uh, the danger of Israel itself. Israel has been able to ramp up increasing forms of militancy and, and oppression that are unheard of. I mean, using phosphorus bombs, cluster bombs, when the situation has arisen. Since 2000, you have about 8,000 Palestinians who have been killed in different forms of, of uh, oppression uh, and overt military uh, use of arms. This is against... Uh, obviously a civilian population that's been totally controlled that should have United Nations protection, by the way, okay, because it's majority refugee population and most of them are, are administered under refugee law. But uh, that aside, so it's a dangerous era. On top of that, uh, the right, racist right wing in Israel has completely taken over the, the, the agenda and the politics of the state and they are empowered to do so by the US and the Western Bloc and of course Australia. Um, uh, and they openly propagate talking about ethnic cleansing, keeping the racist ethnic cleansing notions alive of preservation. So whenever you hear the Jewish state and Palestinians need to recognize the Jewish state, it's basically a, call, a code for allowing the continued process of ethnic cleansing to take place. When Obama himself says that Palestinians have to recognize this Jewish character, and when he says that settlements are an irritant to both sides, what are settlements? It's basically the transplanting of a, a, a Jewish settler colonial group onto, onto mountaintops, integrating these areas into Israel proper, whatever that is, and uh, uh, creating these areas as forward military bases in the context of a future war. It's, a, it's a, both a demographic war, a slow-paced war, both to push the Palestinians out, and if military conditions arise where they can do it in a larger scale, potentially in Iran, potentially further down the road, if Arab oil goes down as a leverage with the West, these are part of the ideological makeup of Israel. Second, there are important internal divisions that are taking place amongst Palestinians, uh, between Fatah and Hamas. Uh, these have to do, it's more important for us to understand what these are about, than to niche, and obviously to have our own politics about it, but not to aid in the division of what is taking place there. Fatah came to emerge with a certain political ideology that basically said, arose from the diaspora that came to understand that we needed to have a territorial base for our movement to administer our affairs from which we could begin to hopefully expand uh, our, our rights and, uh, it, because we were too weak to, uh, to, to do it under Arab governments. We were too weak in the context of the, the overall imperial alliance of the region. It was a non-popular strategy based upon trying to integrate the Palestinian movement as part of the sort of uh, geopolitical game, not recognizing that Palestinian nationalism itself 
was fundamentally zero sum in terms of the, the US uh, and Israeli uh, politics for the region. It would totally debunk the whole Zionist ideology and it's not acceptable. So even all the concessionary positions that the Palestinian Authority gives are actually not enough. Uh, but part of its strategy is actually to try and say, look, we are open and willing to play the game, so why aren't, are we a children of a lesser god? That's part of Fatah's strategy. Hamas, on the other side, has sort of been able to fill the space where Fatah, in the concessions that it gave to playing the political game, it filled those spaces. So, filled the space of non-recognition of Israel, of upholding the right to resistance, of upholding elements of the liberationist discourse of the Palestinian movement, and basically has simply incrementally taken over that space without really offering very much in terms of how beyond that, how things were going to be achieved. On the other hand, I will say, those are the strategic dangers. There are some important shifts, political shifts that are taking place, and you hear it in Obama's discourse itself. Firstly, it's important to gain strength and gain recognition from the fact that these policies have been entirely unsuccessful. Palestinian resistance has not stopped from day one, and including in, the, in this peace process era. Even the bourgeois national leadership of Fatih refused to sign on to the Camp David Surrender Agreement, okay? And the Palestinians were willing to fight in the Intifada to try and stop the machinations of this process and expose them for the hypocrisy that they were. They were able to try and push back Israeli settler colonial ambitions, at least in Gaza. That was an achievement of the Intifada itself. In the 2006 elections, when Hamas comes to power, it was a reaffirmation that Palestinians were still holding on to their political vision of liberation in its total, total definition. And despite the continued bludgeoning of the Israeli war machine and the Western backers behind it, Palestinians have not succumbed, despite increasing layers of, of bludgeoning. The second important uh, thing that's quite uh, it, well, I'm on 20 minutes, so I got two minutes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Of course, the second ray of hope is the Arab revolutions. No question about it. But don't be deceived. This is not Arabs coming in solidarity to Palestinians. The, Israel is a cause that is just as much directed against the Arab people. It has bombed eight different countries uh, throughout its history, launched six different wars, killed hundreds of thousands of people. In the in 1956 war, they were carpet bombed Cairo, killed more than 50,000 people. Doesn't, people don't even know anything about it. Every Arab theater which is having a revolution today has been directly intervened in by Israel on behalf of trying to offset one group against another or physically to put down the powers that be there. Thirdly, you have Israel is more and more increasingly divided, weak, and isolated. Important strategic divisions are coming out between Judaism, Jews, and Zionism. And we need to deepen these, these, these uh, structural divisions. Uh, and it, there are increasing limitations to the effect of its military power and the effect of its discourse that it's convincing in terms of being that the Jewish democratic state is a legitimate project. Finally, there are important solidarity forces that are emerging, and you today here compose part of that as part of the Western Bloc and Axis. In that regard, do not doubt for a second that the work that you do on a daily basis to focus, to educate people, to build the left, to build solidarity for the Arab revolutions, to build and educate about the nature of Israel, the nature of Palestinian oppression, that those struggles are key for Shutting down the oxygen that keeps Israel alive as a viable project. Educating people, creating the institutions from which we can win in the long term on a war of position and eventually a war of movement. The more we build an Australian left and a left internationally, we, the, the building of left values is dialectically connected to supporting Palestinian rights and all other basic workers' rights, human rights, what have you. So the project must be to work with determination and focus, not getting uh, confused by the discourse and whatnot, breaking it down and remaining committed and focused on the path. Onwards. <laughs>
thank you all for coming. It's an amazing turnout, and thank you also for Marxism for inviting me, because one of the issues I'm going to talk about today is a bit different to Tafik. Mine is going to be a little bit more about the Jewish community, both here and overseas, and how there's been a shift in the last five years, which I think is encouraging on one level to say that this debate actually is in the Jewish community, or should I say the more progressive Jewish community, is some signs for hope. One of the things that's clear about this debate, particularly since 9-11, has been that the neoconservative movement has, in my view, captured much of the Jewish community. What I mean by that is not that every single Jew supports neoconservative values. They don't. But what has happened is that they've often allowed voices within the Jewish establishment in Australia, in the US, in Europe, and elsewhere, to speak for Jews. And what I mean by that is this, that when, say, the Iraq war came up, when, say, the war against Afghanistan, when, say, a potential war against Iran, when, say, a potential war, actual wars against Gaza, in 2008, 2009, and in fact, late last year, voices of dissent within the Jewish community are real, and they exist, then a more hardline pro-Israel view dominates. And I wanted to start off by saying that until the Jewish community itself, here and overseas, tackles the fact that the majority of voices that we're hearing by Jews are from that perspective, the Jewish community has a profound problem on its hands. And the issue, I think, with that is that although there are growing numbers, as I'm going to explain, of Jews both here and overseas who are critical of Israel, who are anti-Zionist, who campaign with all of you, I'm sure there's a number of Jews in the audience here, who campaign against what Israel does, the loudest voices in that community are not them. And there are reasons for that, which I'll get to in a minute. One of the struggles that we have in the Jewish community, and I speak as an atheist Jew, who's not really involved in the community except by throwing stones towards it from the outside, <laughs> is that in some ways liberal Zionism is in Christ. Let me explain what that is for those who don't know. Many Jews will see themselves as Zionists. When you grow up in the Jewish community, it's a rare Jew who says, I'm an anti-Zionist when they're 10 years old or 15 years old. It exists. It exists, but it's rare. And many Jews in the community, both here and overseas, grow up for different reasons, I'll explain in a minute, supporting Israel, maybe even simply to say, well, because of my grandparents were in the Holocaust, or because I, I'm told by my Jewish colleagues or friends that, God forbid, something happens in Melbourne or somewhere else, we have somewhere to go. This argument, although it might sound bizarre to an audience here, actually is real. And many Jews in the community who may have had no fear in their lives at all do have this idea, which is obviously insulated and given by parents, grandparents, Jewish youth groups, etc., that unless there's a safe homeland for Jews, we are screwed. That line is real. However, the problem has become in the last decades, as Tafik explained, the profound disconnect between the reality and the rhetoric. So on the one hand, many Jews will still say, we believe in a democracy, it should be a Jewish democratic state, there's liberal values, Israel should support Palestinians, it should be two equal states. The facts on the ground speak for themselves. The occupation, in my view, is permanent. It's not reversible, which has obviously been deliberate plan to think as explain why that is. And what that really means is that a number of so-called prominent liberal Zionists, Peter Beinhart, some of you may have heard of, Peter Beinhart's an American Orthodox Jew, very prominent Jew in America. He supported the Iraq war, said afterwards that was a bit of a mistake, sorry about that, he's moved on, haven't we all? And, apart from the Iraqis of course who are in great shape, clearly, but Beinhardt is an interesting case study where liberal Zionism is so profoundly wrong. He wrote a book last year called The Crisis of Zionism, and the title speaks for itself. The crisis is with Zionism, it's not with Palestinians who are occupied, the crisis is with Zionism itself. And what he's arguing in that book, and I think it's important we understand why that book is actually so important and to oppose it, is that he argues that the point is that many Jews who see themselves, he's talking about the US particularly, but it's relevant here, liberal Jews who see themselves as liberal, who enjoy a liberal existence, liberal life, multiculturalism, all that kind of stuff, are in some ways allowing a Jewish Zionist establishment to support a state that fundamentally opposes those values. So there's a disconnect. And he's worried in this book about growing numbers of young Jews in America, but it's equally relevant here, who are turning away from Israel because their values are simply contradicted by what is happening on the ground in Palestine, let alone in Israel itself. The way he suggests we should deal with this is something we won't agree on, but what he argues clearly is that the Jewish community needs to be more open. We can agree on that point. It needs to accept that Palestinians are human beings. 
Good point. <laughs> we need to accept the fact that there is profound right-wing fascism in Israel. We can agree on that. What we can't agree on is this fundamental point. What he says in the book, and he says in many interviews as well, is he's not actually calling for equal rights for both peoples. He's not calling for that. What he's calling for is Palestinians should have far more rights than they do now. Yes. But ultimately, what's important here is maintaining the nature of a Jewish democratic, in his words, state. They're fundamentally contradictory. You can't have one and the other, as Tafik explained. You can't have one and the other. But the effect of Beinhardt's book in the US actually has been revealing. The effect has been that many Jews in the more hardline establishment are petrified that someone like Beinhardt, who I think is about 40-ish, speaks for a number of young Jews. And therefore, if growing numbers of young Jews in the Zionist establishment's view are going to be more vocal against Israel, we're screwed. We being dominant, blind support for Israel in the US. And the effect that Beinhardt has had, actually, I think, in many ways, is a, is a positive thing. His message, not so much, but the effect of it is important that someone who is from the heart of the Jewish Zionist establishment comes out and says, with all the problems of his argument, with all the problems, and there are major ones, as I've explained, despite that, still says, we as Jews have a problem. Allowing a Jewish establishment for so long to allow repression against Palestinians, not just to be okay, but to support and fund it. For those who don't know in the US, many groups who support settlements get tax, deduct tax deductibility status. A bit of a problem, you could argue. <laughs> And yet, despite that, as Tafig rightly said, this doesn't make a difference whether Republican or Democrats in the White House. It actually makes no difference at all. And the problem has been in the last four years, which I know is an issue that's been discussed this weekend, that in many ways Obama has neutered much of the US left on a range of issues, not least Iraq, Afghanistan, and others, and I would argue Palestine. The left exists in the US. Obviously, it has value and strength. But a lot of the voices that were equally against Bush have remained far too quiet in the last four years. Very quiet about a range of issues in the hope that, well, he's a bar you know, maybe he'll get something sorted in the second term. To which I would say, dream on. So the Obama that came to Israel two weeks ago, as Tafik rightly explained, almost, I would argue, sealed the fate of Oslo. And it was sealed, arguably, with the day it was signed. But let's, for argument's sake, say it was sealed two weeks ago. But there's a problem with that, isn't there? Because ultimately, if you believe that there needs to be, as I do and many people in this room, a one-state equation, however that is designed, an equal state where all peoples, Christian, Muslims, Jews, atheists, Baha'is, whatever, live in one equal state, which I would argue is an inevitability at some point, which I'll get to in a minute. The problem is that there is no political mechanism desired by Obama's visit to change that. And as Tafik rightly said, there is no desire to change that equation anyway. The weird thing is, why exactly did Obama go? He's not being re-elected. He's going to be finished in three and a half, four years. I would argue he went there for one reason, that was about Iran. The issue is the next war, which Tafik touched on, and again we have in America and Australia the loudest Jewish voices arguing for years that there needs to be a military strike against Iran. That is the challenge to resist that, because ultimately, yet again, there will be the loudest voices, who are Jewish voices, calling for another war against a Muslim nation in the Middle East. And as someone who, as everyone in this room, I'm guessing, believes in peace and justice, finds that profoundly disturbing when the loudest voices, the wider non-Jewish community, which is obviously most people, hear is Jews yet again calling for a war against a Muslim nation. We should be very worried about the backlash, in my view, against that. So one of the things that's come up by the profound disconnect between rhetoric and reality is Jewish descent. And that's a very broad term, but let me explain briefly what that means. One of the so-called successes of the Jewish establishment here and in much of the West, particularly the US, is Jewish schooling. Australia, for a reason, is known as one of the most pro-Israel Jewish communities in the world, along with South Africa. There's no question about that. And that's done for a few reasons. Jewish schooling is very important here. Um, that's a big point. And also Jewish youth groups. And I just want to briefly mention on the case many of you will have heard of, of Ben Zigia, who I'm sure, just briefly those who don't know, 
Ben Sigia is a was a Melbourne Jew who went to, moved to Israel about 10 years ago and joined the Mossad and a few years ago died and was killed in an Israeli prison. We don't exactly know the, the facts of that story. Now the reason this case is important and instructive is that how the Jewish community and the politicians reacted to it in the last few months. The issue has not fundamentally been we have a problem with an Australian Jew moving to Israel and allegedly committing crimes for a foreign state. That wasn't the problem. The problem was that it came out in the press. That was the problem. And the response in the Jewish news, which is the main and sadly only major Jewish newspaper in the country, was that we're pissed off. This is their words, not mine, I'm paraphrasing. We're pissed off with the fact that somehow our allegiance is questioned. Our being the Jewish allegiance is questioned to Australia. And my response to that was, and I spoke often in the press at the time about it, I'll say it again here, is we can't be surprised that many Australians are concerned about an Australian citizen who is given support by an Australian state to move to another state, which happens to be Israel, and commits crimes in the name of that state. This to me is a fundamental issue that Australia as a government, which frankly it won't do, needs to address. And the reason the Ben Zigia case is so important is that actually it has caused many in the Jewish community in Australia, those who have spoken out about it, in Sydney and Melbourne particularly, to be curious about what kind of blind support Jews are giving to Israel. And do we feel comfortable as a community with individuals like that working for the Mossad? And I would argue, damn right, we are not at all. The issue, I think Kim's going to touch on the question of BDS, boycott, divestment, sanction, but I want to mention a few things about that. Ultimately, what's been fascinating in the last few years, and I don't want to steal Kim's thunder on this, but what's been fascinating in the last few years, on the one hand, is the utter ferociousness of the anti-BDS backlash in this country. And yet, and yet, despite that, in public <coughs> survey after another, in the last 10 years, support for Palestine and Australia is growing and growing and growing. I'm not saying it's majority, I'm not saying we're about to have, indeed, let's clap that. Um, we're not about to have in Australia a so-called Palestine Spring. We're about a few years for that. And we're not about to have the Palestinian flag raised in the parliament in Canberra. Give, give it a few months. And despite that, yet again, virtually every politician in the Australian federal parliament, apart from a handful, and I'd say a few Greens, Lee Rhiannon amongst a few others, do speak out for Palestine, which I think should be far more noted than it is. Virtually every single politician in the Australian Parliament, in most states and federally, are, in, I would say, uncontroversially bought by the Israel lobby. I'm not saying in a financial sense. I'm saying there is a tendency of both virtually every mainstream union, with exceptions, including some in this room, but some of the, the AWU, which sadly is a major union, and others are blindly pro-Israel. Despite all that, despite most of the mainstream press, the Murdoch press, much of the Fairfax press, sometimes the ABC, fundamentally have been opposed to BDS, allowing the rhetoric against it to be supposedly anti-Semitic. Despite all that, despite all that, support for Palestine has never been high. That's instructive. That's instructive because you realise a lot of people are far smarter than most of the media gives them credit for, point one. And point two, what's happened in the last 10 years, which is why many young Jews are increasingly as well being more critical, is that turn on the television, use the internet. You can have very easily what's happening on the ground in Palestine instantly, tweeting, whatever it may be. I mean, a lot of people, many of you will be aware in this room, people are going to non-violent protests in the West Bank, it's being live tweeted. You can read about it as it's happening. In other words, the effect of seeing that, think of five broken cameras, a film many of you will have heard of was nominated, amazingly, didn't win, unsurprisingly, for a uh, Best Documentary Oscar this year in uh, the States. But that film, for those of you who haven't seen, is instructive. When a film like that is given a massive amount of coverage in the US and elsewhere, supported by Mike Moore, the filmmaker, and says, this is what our tax dollars are funding. This is what our tax dollars are supporting. Violent repression against non-violent resistance. That is having an effect on public opinion. And you know that because the Jewish establishment and Michael Oren, who's the Israeli ambassador to the US, has said consistently in the last six months, publicly, we are worried about how these films affect our image. We're not worried about what we're doing. Yeah. We're worried about the fact that image is being fucked up, frankly. And that's something we should be pretty happy about. I want to end with a couple of points. 
So Fig touched on the Arab Spring, and clearly in any discussion about how this is affecting views towards Palestine, it can't be ignored. But let's not also forget, as you correctly said, if anyone thought that a so-called more democratic Egypt would be more friendly to Palestinians, dream on. Because the current Muslim Brotherhood government in Egypt is arguably, or maybe inarguably, as repressive against Palestinians in Gaza as it was under Mubarak. And there's one very good reason for that. Because the Egyptian regime wants to get, and continue to get, US military support. Over $2 billion every year. So I'm not for a second belittling and suggesting that the Arab Spring and the Egyptian Revolution wasn't vital. Of course it was, and it continues to be so. But the effect of it towards Palestinians has not simply been a greater openness and liberation, has not. To the point where Hamas tunnels between Egypt and Gaza have been flooded more with the Brotherhood than they were under Mubarak, often a lifeline for a siege which is still being um, enforced by Israel and Egypt. Let's not forget that. And let me close with this. Often when we talk about Palestine, I feel that there can be a sense sometimes that there's disillusionment about the facts on the ground, as Tafik rightly said, would suggest things aren't going to change tomorrow. That's absolutely correct. But the importance of solidarity on this question and the importance of awareness globally, virtually every country, the US is a weird ex exception for so many reasons, but for many other countries, support for Palestine has never been higher. In the public, there, is, there are moves now as hopeless as the European Union has been for years, endorsing, supporting, funding, backing the Israeli occupation. There is growing movement for some kind of settlement boycott. It's a start, it ain't enough but it's something. And what Israel profoundly fears, as Obama ironically suggested in his speech a few weeks ago, is isolation. People don't give up privilege by choice. And white South Africans in the 90s didn't give up their repressive regime because one day they thought, you know what, we love black people, they're great. <laughs> didn't work that way. It worked because over decades and decades there was massive pressure economically, culturally, politically and socially against what South Africa was doing. And Israel is facing exactly the same response in a far faster way than South Africa ever did. And that, I think, is a cause for hope. Thank you. with Socialist Alternative. Uh, this is a uh, Socialist Alternative conference which is being put on Marxism 2013. Uh, I encourage people to try and come back and stay for some of the rest of the conference. There are a number of other sessions which deal with uh, similar sorts of themes uh, that we've started to talk about today. One of them, um, if you'd like to hear more from Tufik, he's speaking tomorrow on the development of a neoliberal Palestinian elite. Uh, so please have a look at the agenda and come back for that. And then also this afternoon, there is going to be a talk and a discussion by Jewish historian Janie Stone, who's going to be talking about the resistance to uh, the Nazis in Poland. Uh, and that will also be accompanied by uh, singing of resistance songs uh, by a local performer, Rachel Stansky. So I encourage people to come back for that this afternoon as well. Pardon? It's and it's a new talk. So, uh, <laughs> so if you heard Janie last year on a relatively similar theme, uh, she definitely wants to assure you that this is not the same uh, and you really should come back um, as it's bound to be pretty wonderful. Uh, okay, our final speaker on the pal panel today is Kim Bullimore. I introduced her before. So take Great. it away, Kim. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for coming. It's a fantastic turnout. I hope you don't mind if I sit because um, I didn't get a chance to print off my notes. So I'm going to kind of read off my uh, netbook. Before I start, I just want to uh, acknowledge that today is uh, 30th of March. It's actually Palis Palestinian Land Day. Um, <laughs> So for the, the people who may not
not know what that's all about. In 1976, uh, the Israeli state were about to expropriate uh, about 60,000 Dunhams of land within inside the Green Line. Uh, so thousands of Palestinians came out to protest this. This was the first mass protest inside Israel by Palestinians uh, since basically 1948, because from 1949 to 1966, Palestinians lived under military rule, which restricted just about everything that they could do. And it only applied to Palestinian citizens of Israel, not to Jewish citizens. And basically, on that day uh, in 1976, uh, the Israeli state opened fire on the Palestinian protesters. Six were killed. Uh, hundreds of uh, people were injured and hundreds were um, uh, uh, jailed. So, But this marked really for the first time in modern history the unification of Palestinians working inside Israel uh, in the occupied, then occupied territories and obviously Palestinians in, in, resist, uh, um, in uh, refugees in, uh, in exile uh, working together around one specific issue of the um, trying to stop the ethnic cleansing of Palestinians. So I think it's really important that um, I think it's great we're having the talk today on this. So what I'm going to cover uh, today hopefully is uh, I want to talk a little bit about the BDS campaign. So I want to talk about two aspects but it may not quite happen because of the time limit but if I can, I will. Um, I basically want to talk a little bit about um, BDS as being a, what it is as an anti-normalisation campaign and also then talk a little bit about the assessment of BDS so far here in Australia. So, just over four years ago, in December 2008, the Popular Committee Against the Wall for the Palestinian Village of Berlin uh, in the Occupied West Bank and the Israeli Anarchists Against the Wall were jointly awarded the Karl von Oeskeski, I hope I pronounced that right, Human Rights Award in um, uh, Berlin. The award uh, was named for a 1935 German Nobel Peace Prize winner who was a journal journalist and pacifist and who died in a Nazi concentration camp. And it's awarded every year for outstanding service um, to the realisation of basic and human rights. In their speech at the award ceremony, a representative from the uh, Israeli anarchists noted that the activists um, were originally reluctant to accept the prize for political activism, saying, to quote, we would prefer not to be singled out for glory and receive gratitude for what we feel is our duty. The anarchists against the war representative, however, went on to state that despite that, they would accept the award because, and this is uh, a, a quote from their uh, speech, here on the podium, just as in the olive groves in the, of the West Bank, our primary moral duty is not to maintain, maintain ideological purity, but to rather to stand with the Palestinians in their resistance to oppression. We recognise the importance of garnering international support for the ongoing struggle. We believe that standing here in the current state of affairs is a direct continuation of blocking the bulldozers, standing side by side with the stone throwers, of running away from tear gas along with young and elderly protesters. Here, as in the olive groves, I would like to stress that we are not equal partners, but rather <coughs> occupiers who join the occupied in their struggle. We are aware of the fact that for many, the participation of Israelis in a Palestinian struggle um, serves as a stamp of approval. But in our eyes, this partnership is not about granting legitimacy. The Palestinian struggle is legitimate with or without us. The struggle is an opportunity for us to cross in action rather than words, the barriers of national allegiance. So as leftists, socialists and pro-Palestine solidarity activists and human rights activists, it's important for us to understand that the Palestinian civil society boycott, divestment and sanctions campaign that was initiated in 2005 is a continuation of the work done on the ground by Palestinians involved in the popular resistance in occupied Palestine and elsewhere. The BDS campaign, like the struggle on the ground in Palestine, gives not only activists like many of us here, the room, uh, the room uh, in this room, but ordinary people across the, the world who believe in human rights and justice for all, the opportunity to cross in action rather than words the barriers of national allegiance and to stand with the Palestinian society, which has since 1948 suffered decades of human rights abuses. The Palestinian BDS campaign, at its heart, is an anti-colonial and anti-normalisation campaign. It's a campaign that does not attempt to draw any equal sign between the coloniser and the colonised, between the oppressor and the oppressed. As a comprehensive anti-colonial and anti-normalisation campaign, BDS addresses the plight of the Palestinian people as a whole, not just Palestinians living under occupation. So what do we mean when we talk about an anti-normalisation campaign? Basically, normalisation is the political act of normalising oppression. 
So rather than challenge oppression, it, it, it works to accept it as being normal. It often promotes a false sense of parity between the oppressed and the oppressor. Those who engage in normalisation either ignore the oppression that is taking place, or they accept the status quo, or they fail to challenge it, or they attempt to whitewash the oppression that is taking place. Normalisation psychology can often be described as a form of colonisation of the mind, uh, and that can be both for the oppressed and the oppressor. For the oppressed subjects, it comes, it, it comes as a form of believing that the oppressor's reality is your reality. It's the only normal thing that exists, and, it's the only, and that you have to learn to cope within that. So countering normalisation, as the BDS campaign does, is a means to re resist oppression. Anti-normalisation campaigning is not something new uh, in the Palestinian uh, movement. It's not something that's just come about with BDS. It's actually been part of the Palestinian struggle from the very, very beginning. Uh, I could cite many, many, many instances of when it happened during the British mandate, but I'll just cite, cite two. In 1929, Palestinians staged a boycott uh, after the, uh, uh, the uh, anti-wall uh, demonstrations that took place in 1929, uh, and they staged a boycott of Israeli products and goods. And then again in 1936, you had what was the uh, beginning of the... Um, is it 10 minutes already? No, no. no, no. <laughs> I was going to say, oh. <laughs> uh, and then 1936, uh, you had the beginning of really, in effect, what which was the first inter real first intifada, which was the Palestinian revolt, which went for three years. It basically began in, uh, in April in Nablus uh, with a strike, uh, a general strike that spread across Palestine, which went for something like 190 days. Uh, and this was a, a clear-cut anti normal normalisation campaign uh, uh, um, opposing not only British occupation but also opposing um, uh, uh, Zionist settler colonialism. So this is a tradition that's been very much part of the campaign. However, as, we, as Tufik spoke about uh, the Oslo period, what we saw there was um, a pullback, unfortunately, a sidelining, I suppose, of the anti-normalisation campaign in favour of pro-normalisation campaigns. Basically, the Oslo Accord can only be described as a pro-normalisation process. It deepened the occupation, it deepened uh, the oppression that Palestinians uh, were experiencing, and it made sure that it was very hard Hard to ensure any liberation for Palestinians. So, but what we have started to see now is a reversal of that. With the failure of Oslo and the rise of BDS, anti-normalisation campaigning is now much back on the forefront of the Palestinian agenda, and it's back on the forefront of international solidarity campaigning. So I want to touch a little bit um, about the broader issue of um, uh, boycott divestments and sanctions. Um, uh, Anthony mentioned Peter Beinhardt, who I'm going to briefly reference here. BDS campaign doesn't have uh, a monopoly on the boycott um, uh, tactic. It never has uh, claimed to do that. But there's also a difference between the boycott campaign that BDS is uh, promoting and the boycott campaigns that often left Zionists are promoting. So people like Peter Beinhardt, for example, uh, as uh, Anthony said, uh, him and other left liberal Zionists are very worried about BDS because it is making a difference. So they're proposing things like a Zionist boycott. So um, what they mean by that is they're not actually uh, interested in putting Palestinians' rights at the forefront of that campaign, it's about saving Israel. That's what it comes down to. Uh, so they're saying, yes, on one hand, let's boycott settlement products, and we shouldn't say that that's a bad thing. That's actually good. Anybody who wants to boycott a settlement product, whether it is liberal uh, Zionist or whether it be anti-Zionist, a pro-Palestinian activist, is a good thing. But we should also be very clear about the political framework and parameters that these different campaigns take place in, and that's very important. It is possible for Jewish activists to be part of the BDS campaign. Many Jewish organisations and Jewish activists are involved in the campaign. In America, you have, for example, Jewish Voices for Peace. In Israel, you have groups like Boycott from Within, uh, the Israeli uh, um, uh, Committee Against uh, House Demolitions is pro-full uh, BDS for, from the Palestinian perspective. Also, groups like Coalition of Women for Peace. Um, so I'm going to now jump to... I'm hoping I'm not jumping too over the place because I'm just really worried about time. I want to jump to BDS in Australia. So what does that mean? Uh, so in Australia, the left has had a long tradition of solidarity with the oppressed people of the world. Uh, and we've also had a long... Uh, um, 
involvement in anti-normalisation campaigns, whether it be in relation to South Africa or East Timor or other places like that. But the reality here is, in here in Australia, BDS is still in its infancy compared to in Europe or the USA. We only had our first national conference around BDS in 2010, and it was only, only coming out of that conference that Palestine solidarity groups around the country started to have a more concentrated focus on BDS campaigning. On the whole, the campaigning has been very much in the context of the anti-normalisation campaigning, as I've outlined. In the first year or so of the campaign, I think that many of the various campaign groups, as well as other activists outside the campaign groups who were supportive of BDS, were still trying to figure out how we support BDS, how do we conduct the campaigns, how do we carry out the issues. Um, we wanted, and so what I want to look now at is two of the main uh, really prominent campaigns that came about in the last um, uh, uh, two years or so. The first one is in December 2010. People will remember the New South Wales Greens passed a motion supporting BDS. Uh, a week later, the Greens on Sydney Marrickville Council sought um, council support for a BDS campaign there. The motion was adopted 10 to 2, um, and the BDS campaign hit the, uh, the national media. Over the next couple of months, with the lead-up to the New South Wales state election, the Greens and the Maricopa Council endured an orchestrated campaign led by Zionist groups and quickly backed by the Murdoch press um, to try and um, uh, use BDS as a wedge campaign against the Greens, as well as to oppose BDS in general. While pro-Palestine activists staged a valiant campaign in opposition to the backlash, it was clear that not enough groundwork had been done before the campaign to prepare campaigners for the backlash that would happen. Four months later, 19 uh, non-violent BDS activists, including Vashti here, were arrested outside the Israeli-owned chocolate uh, shop Max Brenner uh, here in Melbourne. The protest was the fourth BDS action that had taken place since December outside of Max Brenner. Uh, video footage of the of the of the um, protest where the arrests happened show that the. Uh, the protest was completely peaceful, yet the protesters were kettled uh, and charged uh, with trespassing and besetting. Once again, BDS supporters, simil uh, similar to what happened in Marrickville, were, were defamed by the Murdoch press uh, and other Zionist groups as anti-Semitic and Nazis. Some in the movement were actually taken back by the negative press coverage and the assault on BDS, but for, uh, in reality it should not have come as a surprise to any of us. Activists in the US, France, UK and Canada have all faced uh, exactly the same pushback from pro-Zionist forces uh, that, have, uh, that have sought to use the state um, to criminalise um, BDS, uh, so using both the police and the court systems. We need to understand that the arrests here in Melbourne at the Max Brenner protest were not accidental or the fault of the protesters. In the hearing case, um, very hearings that took place uh, during the court case around the campaign, the police made it clear that the decision to attack the protest and arrest activists was made well before the demonstration and it came after discussion with Zionist organisations, the Victorian government, shopping centre management and the state and national management of Max Brenner. It was part of a nationally coordinated campaign developed and backed by the Israeli Foreign Ministry, something that was clearly noted in several reports in the Australian Jewish News. So what should we learn? I would like to say more about this, but because of time restrictions, I'm not. So what I'm going to look at now is what are some of the lessons that we could learn from what happened with Max Brenner and with Marrickville. One of the things that was raised uh, by some of the more pe uh, people who were a little bit more worried about what was happening with the campaign was that Max Brenner was a problem target and it was difficult to connect why we were boycotting um, it and the struggle in Palestine. I would answer that, that that's true and not so true. Um, in America, um, there has been campaigns around, uh, uh, run very successfully around Sabra Hummus, which is also owned by uh, Strauss, who owns Max Brenner as well. Um, and um, Because Strauss, if people don't know, it's the Strauss group, um, why they were targeted and Max Brenner was targeted, is that they give active support to the Israeli military, in particular the Goloni and the Gavati brigades, who uh, were the two key brigades that went into Gaza uh, during the 2009 assault, uh, which saw 1,400 Palestinians 
is killed. The main differences between our campaign in Melbourne and the campaign in the US is that campaigns were able to target educational institutes and co-ops, whereas we had a bit more of an amorphous campaign. Yes, in one respect, we failed to set clear aims for the goals. That's where we fell down. We, we failed to set clear aims and goals for the Max Brenner campaign. We were swept up into the reactive campaign, it did not clarify what we were trying to achieve via the campaign, <coughs> other than raising awareness about Israeli's occupation and apartheid practices. We did articulate what we wanted, we didn't articulate what we wanted to do at a local level, level in relation to Max Brenner. So um, while we were able to attract significant support for the demonstrations, we also failed to engage in enough capacity building and involving people uh, in, in, in uh, a range of um, activities outside the actual demonstrations. Um, in hindsight, we probably should have organised more leafleting, we should have organised more educational stalls and various things to try and educate the, the general public about Max Brenner. Um, like the Marrickville cam campaign, because the campaign moved into re reactive activity, we did not ha have time to work out the strategic goals. Um, I'm going to talk, uh, sorry, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to jump now down to the media lessons. One of the important things was a lot of people were a little freaked out about the negative media. At one stage, uh, I think in one month alone, we were covered in the Murdoch press in uh, July, August and September. I think in the uh, uh, August or September, there was something like 16 articles by The Australian on BDS alone. So basically there was an article every second day. Sometimes there was two articles a day. Um, so we need to know, uh, we need to prepare in a number of ways for this backlash and to uh, make sure that we're able to counter it. First of all, our spokespeople need to know their stuff. We need to recognise that the media, the mainstream media, is not our friend. It is just not our friend. We need to be proactive and not defensive. We need to not let the media distract us. And we need to uh, make sure that we get across what we want to get across and not let them put across their agenda. Of course, we can't control what they publish and don't publish, but we can control what we say to them. We also should be not frightened of running a defence campaign. When the 19 activists were arrested, it was very, very important that we run that defence campaign and not just give up. It allowed us to reach out to a broader uh, section of the general public. Uh, it allowed us to um, have meetings of up to 100 people with 14 different campaign groups and unions involved in it. It helped us to build stronger links with the unions. So this de ca defence campaign was very, very important. It helped us also forge links with the Aboriginal rights campaign to raise awareness about Palestine on campuses and off campuses. Um, sorry, I'm just running quickly. So what I want to say is for the next period, we're now moving into a new period of campaigning and a number of campaign groups around the country have already set targets for BDS campaigning over the next year, including for here in Melbourne, Students for Palestine, and I think other groups might be taking up as well, is the, uh, the campaign around Bay Ele uh, Electronics, uh, which is British Aerospace Electronics, which has uh, connections with RMIT. There's already been a terrific action here. Uh, the Kaya here in Melbourne, Coalition Against Israeli Apartheid, will also be running a campaign around SodaStream, as will um, uh, a number of other Palestine solidarity groups around the country. With all of these campaigns, what we have to be very clear about it is actually making sure that we set the strategic goals of what we want to do with those campaigns from the outset. We can't go into the campaigns and just react uh, to whatever may come from it. So, for example, with the Kaya campaign, we've already, uh, around SodaStream, we've already started to say, well, some of the things that we want to do is trying to persuade companies who stock SodaStream <coughs> to destock that um, uh, that product. We want to be able to get companies, environmental companies, who have partnered with SodaStream to break those partnerships. They are very concrete goals, and if we can win even one of those goals, then that is a step forward for BDS campaigning in this country, and it's a step forward for the Palestinian struggle, uh, uh, both in Australia and internationally. So, um, sorry, my talk was a little bit all over the place because I was worried about cutting down the, talk, the time. So I'm going to leave it about that, but if comrades uh, or uh, supporters want to ask any questions, obviously, in discussion, we can address it then. Thank you.